Welcome to the Australian Finance Podcast, a podcast for people who want to learn more about their personal finances and get the most from their money. This series is hosted by Kate Campbell from How To Money and Owen Raskovich from Rask Finance. The Australian Finance Podcast is provided for educational purposes only. The information is general in nature and does not take into account your needs, goals or objectives. What that means is the information does not apply to you specifically. So consider getting the advice of a licensed and trusted professional before acting on the information. Okay, Kate, welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. It's good to be back and we've actually got a special guest on today. Mm -hmm, We do indeed. Nicole Haddo, you've just penned a book on millennials and investing in Australia. So it's great to have you as part of the show and and take us on a deep dive through property and and your experience. Perhaps you can kick things off with just telling us what the book is, um, the motivation for doing it and uh, some of the lessons learned so far. No worries. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, So the book is called Smashed Avocado, and it's a guide for millennials and young people, not strictly millennials, uh, anyone who wants to enter the property market for the first time. Uh, It's my story. So I moved home with my parents when I turned 30, and I had $11,000 worth of credit card debt. So I talk about how I turned it around to buy an investment property. Uh, It's also all of that nuts and bolts advice uh, for young people who maybe are a bit bamboozled by the the concept of applying for a loan, how much Mm. money you need that sort of thing Uh, and there's a stack of really amazing creative case studies in there as well so really clever young people who found interesting ways to enter the market yeah great i know kate was recently away in new zealand (laughs) and got stuck into the book because it's only just come out right yeah it's been out for about three weeks now yeah cool um how long did it take you to write uh, well, I wrote it pretty fast because uh, there was a pretty strong demand for it. So um, I signed with my publisher in September last year uh, and I had the first draft. I'd started the first draft um, earlier in the year and I'd completed it by the end of the year. And then the first half of this year was uh, editing. Hmm. Wow, right. that is a quick. It was pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So editing, was that the harder part, the more trying part? Uh, yeah, editing is definitely difficult. Um, the challenge is uh, a lot of the information in the book is based on market movements. So right. every time something happened mm-hmm. in the market, I had to check and make sure I had the most up-to-date information. And obviously it's evolved even since the book's come out. Um, you know, I tried to make it as up-to-date as possible and, and the facts and figures, although some of them have changed slightly, um, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of it remain. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, when I, when I was reading it, it definitely seemed very up to date. Mm. Yeah, look, we were we were making those changes as, as close to publication as possible. Yeah, that's mm. amazing. And I, I think um, when I was reading through it last week uh, when I was away, um, the big thing you started with was actually talking about the power save. Um, and I think that was one of the key steps to getting started because I think you came to the realisation that things don't magically work themselves out. Yes, uh, I had to really reach rock bottom uh, and realize that I was going to have mm. to do something pretty drastic. Um, so the power save for me was uh, was how I turned it around uh, and that meant being completely ruthless in terms of mm. just getting rid of all of my frivolous spending, um, cutting back on the social life, um, really even just down to takeaway coffees. It was it was what, what do I need and what mm. don't I need and everything that I didn't need was, was off the list. Yeah, it seemed like a pretty tough approach to take with yourself it was um but i felt that because i was already 30 um i really needed to make up for lost time so Mm. this was and my parents had said to me you can stay for a year um so it wasn't this (laughs) open-ended invitation um so it was an opportunity to save as much as i could in that 12 month period and i i really did everything i could yeah i think i saw a video of you Uh, i think you said you You started to cry in a restaurant, is that right? I did cry in a restaurant. I've talked about that so much lately. Uh, Yeah, it was my 30th birthday. So I um, I spent the day um, drinking champagne with some friends and um, we were posting pictures on Instagram of us, you know, living this lavish lifestyle. But uh, but it was a lie. Like I was not living (laughs) the lifestyle that I had posted on social media Um, and it was was just sort of this compounding of all of the things in my life that – a, had been amazing in my 20s, but B, I was now going to pay for in my 30s uh, and, and working out that I really needed to do something drastic and being quite emotional about that realisation. Mm, for sure, I would have been because I remember you said something like you're in $11,000 of debt. Is that right? Yeah, so I had two credit cards um, and the reason I had those credit cards was because uh, I was just really, I was trying to get ahead. Um, so 
I worked as a freelance journalist a lot in my 20s. Um, at one point I moved to Sydney um, to work for magazines up there. So I was paying really high level of rent. Um, I had unstable income and sometimes the credit cards were just a way to cover the gap. Um, I was moving a lot in share houses. Um, I was absolutely spending money on things I shouldn't have, travel and clothes and that sort of thing. Um, but a lot of it in my mind was I'll sort this out later. Um, it'll, it'll, it'll all come together. And when I realised at 30 that it hadn't come together and I was no closer to, to finding a solution, I knew that I had to make some serious changes. Mm. Mm. And I definitely think Instagram's a massive part of the problem here um, mm. because we we see these completely fictional lives and maybe maybe they're just doing it off a credit card. We don't know how much of the Instagram profile is funded by a credit card. Well, that day I was sitting by my friend's parents' pool. Um, so, you know, we looked like we were having this lovely time yeah. by the pool and we were having a lovely time by the pool, but the reality was that we were at my friend's parents' house and I'd just moved home with my mum and dad. So... Trying to break that cycle of creating that persona um, was also a part of the challenge. I don't think my Instagram feed would have been nearly as interesting in the, in the year that I was power saving, unfortunately, <laughs> um, but that's what you've got to do. Do you think that the decisions, the hard decisions that you made impacted your social life? Absolutely. So I talk about this a lot in the book and that was something that was a real shock to me um, because I was moving in circles where people really went pretty hard to be honest with you we had uh we had pretty good social life mm -hmm. um wouldn't be unusual to go out and spend 80 dollars on dinner and drinks on a thursday night and then there was being out on the weekend and the taxis and the brunch and all of those things um and when you stop doing that you put pressure on the friendships because all of a sudden you're asking people to change their lifestyle and if they don't want to do that they don't have to do that but it it absolutely creates some friction. And did you develop any strategies for dealing with those relationships as you went through? Mm, I don't know if I developed strategies at the time. I know I found it incredibly difficult, um, but I did end up spending more time with people who were at a different stage in their lives. So mm -hmm. um, good friends of mine, Bo and Kim, uh, had, had a child when I was saving and so they were at home. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd go over to their house and they'd put him to bed and we'd have a very cheap bottle of wine and, mm -hmm. you know, watch mm -hmm. a movie or um, listen to music and talk. Um, so I ended up spending my time with people who who were in a different life phase so that it wasn't so hard for me but it definitely impacted my relationships I mean even dating it's expensive just to to go out for dates if you're a single person and I kind of had to put that on the back burner too mm -hmm. and I, I think that's also even in work setting it's hard when you're the only one not going out with everybody um and I think you said in your book um you chose not to because of the moderation thing? Mm. Well, I have spent most of my career working in the media and uh, people who work in the media are, are well known for <laughs> uh, working hard and playing hard. So it's very hard when uh, on Friday night everyone's leaving the office to go to the pub and you've got to turn around and say, I can't go. Um, but for me, it was either go and watch everybody increasingly get merrier and merrier mm. or just go home and, and you know, sit on the internet and, and look at what properties were online and <laughs> tr try and make it, you know, a useful period of time rather than feeling sorry for myself, which I got to eventually. It took a while though. Mm. Mm. And you kind of work out who the, the real friends are, the people that are happy to come over and just have a, a bottle of wine and maybe some cheese. Or yeah, well, that's exactly it. And I mean, I'm in a different stage now. I've sort of come out the other side and I'm able to go out with everyone and mm. uh, even buy dinner for friends who sort of let me sleep on the couch when I was, you know, trying to do that yeah. power save. So um, it, it, you come full circle, but it was really rewarding in the respect that the people who did stay in my life and support me and those choices are even better friends now than they were then. Mm, for sure. One of the things I heard you say in one of the interviews or videos that you've done on the website is the, you've, you've mentioned some of the creative ways people have made property work for them. And I think there was one instance where a, a couple had bought an old barn and turned it into an Airbnb shack or something like that. Can you recall any particular cases that really just struck you as impressive when you're talking to these young people? Absolutely. I sort of, it's one of those, those things where I wish I'd read my own book before I entered <laughs> the property market. Um, it was really important to me to go out and find people who were finding creative ways to buy entry-level properties. I'm completely aware that for most millennials, the idea of buying an $800,000 or a $900,000 property as their first property is not feasible. Um, so I wanted to find people who were buying entry-level investments, but finding a way to, to turn the concept of having 
getting a mortgage on its head so that it worked for them. So um, Jacob and Brad, who bought the barn, were a really good example. This this was a – it was literally a barn. It had a dirt floor and exposed <laughs> insulation when they bought it and um, – they spent some money renovating and, and uh, they had some handy tradie mates that they could call on um, and they'd paid $220,000 for that property mm. um, and it's now on Airbnb for $200 a night. So mm. um, they're, they're doing really well. Um, it's a beautiful property. There's there's demand for it because it's in Heathcote. Um, near so ben- here in Victoria. In Victoria, yeah, yeah near Bendigo. Um, so, you know, it's a wine region um, close to Bendigo um, and an easy drive out of Melbourne for, as a weekend. Mm. Uh, but then there were a couple, um, Lucy and Nathan, um, they put a house on a truck that was going to be demolished. Wow. Um, the house was in um, Montalbert in in, uh, in Melbourne as well. And um, there, there are companies, the one that they used I think was called Moving Views, uh, but there are companies that are, that are listing these properties. Um, there's plenty available now um, that people can put on a truck and move to a piece of land. Mm. So um, that was incredible. That was incredible. Uh, what would have been a million dollar house where it was um and they put it on a truck and moved it to cheaper land Mm -hmm. um and then it's just people who are you know buying properties that need work and fixing them up and 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 building that equity um or buying in an area where nobody wants at the time and then all of a sudden it's uh it's the place where everyone wants to be Mm -hmm. and i think one of the one of the tough things definitely as a young person is is being realistic and knowing that you probably can't start off with your million dollar home and you might have to start with something a lot smaller. And I think having to come to that realisation is really important when you're getting started because having to come up with a 20% deposit for a million dollar home is going to take a long, long time. But for a $300,000 home, it's probably a lot more feasible. So do you have any sort of suggestions on how young people can be a bit more realistic with their goal for their first home? I think it's really hard because I think a lot of um, young people today would have had parents who were able to buy a freestanding home as their first house. Um, It's not realistic to think your first home is going to be a double-fronted, renovated Victorian house Mm -hmm. in a blue-chip suburb. But um, it is disappointing to realise that you're probably going to have to reset your expectations. Um, For me, that was buying an apartment for starters, and it was buying 25 kilometres out of town, not where I necessarily wanted to live. Um, But to buy in a high growth area uh, that would ideally, you know, the property would go up in value um, with a reasonable pace um, and allow me to take my next step over time. And I think that's, you know, what a lot of, um, although our parents might have bought freestanding homes, a lot of them wouldn't have bought their dream home first up. So Mm. it's different today. Um, You're probably not going to get what you thought you were going to get, but the sooner you kind of reset that expectation and treat it as a financial opportunity rather than a forever home, um, the sooner you can hopefully build equity and take a next step. Yeah, absolutely. And I think probably the one thing is being further out from the city, city centres. I know for us in Melbourne, we everyone that I know wants to be close to the city and that's expensive in terms of rent and in terms of buying a house. Renting in a city is is potentially going to hold you back in yeah. terms of entering the market. So, um, you know, the challenge is what can you do to give up that, that kind of rent? Mm-hmm. Um, if you're really serious about saving, it might mean – you know, can can you move home with your parents? I know not everyone can do that. Um, Can you consider house sitting? Uh, Would you rent further out to get more affordable rent? Um, Kicking rent to the curb is is absolutely the key to to getting an entry-level deposit in a reasonable time frame. Mm. And I know you are mentioning before that rent really holds you back, especially if you're paying mortgage-level rent. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're renting in Richmond or Collingwood or Surrey Hills or Potts Point in Sydney or, you know, any any of the high profile suburbs, um, you would your rent would be on par with an entry level investment. And if you look at it like that, you just sort of sort of start to say, wow, that money could be going to a mortgage every month. Yeah. If only I had the deposit. <laughs> exactly. The deposit is a challenge. Bigger picture here. In your mind, is it should everyone be striving to own a home or is renting okay? I don't necessarily think everyone should be striving to own a home. The thing that I love about our generation is that there are people with all sorts of different values. Maybe they're investing in shares. Maybe they're building a startup from scratch and and, and that's how they intend to make their money. 
My concern is that if you get to retirement and you don't own your home and you don't have enough in savings and superannuation to live for the next 30, 35 years, you've got a challenge on your mm. hands. Uh, you really need to be certain that you are going to have enough money in the bank uh, to cover your life and your health care uh, for the rest of your life after you retire. Um, so and my other concern is if, if it's not your own home, then you need to consider what it means in terms of your landlord kicking you out because they've decided to sell. Um, the instability, uh, mm. if you're renting in your 70s or 80s, is obviously not going to be ideal. So for me, the priority was to get an entry-level investment and hopefully work up to something that, that I would be in an owner-occupier situation eventually. That's important to me. I appreciate that it's not for, ev for everyone, but I would encourage people to, to think about what they want their later years to look like. Mm. Correct me if I'm wrong. Before you wrote the book, you were writing for the Australian Financial Review and you were covering some of the really exclusive properties in Australia. Do you think someone that didn't have that insight into property would have gone on the same journey as you? Um, I don't know. So I was writing the executive property column for the financial review, um, but I was doing that as my side hustle in my first year of home ownership. So I had I had underestimated how much that first year was going to cost me, um, and so I was I just happened to end up writing the executive property column, which turned out to be a real gift because um, I got to learn about the top end of the market and the amount of time I spent thinking about the top end of the market got me thinking about the bottom end of the market mm. and the fact that a, a lot of young people aren't getting um, that inspiring, optimistic advice that they need to, to believe it's achievable. Mm. So one of the things that you talk about in the book is this idea of rent vesting. It's something that we've covered very loosely here on the show. Perhaps you can explain what that is for our listeners and the benefits of it, I guess, in practice. Sure. So rent vesting was my way into the market. Um, I knew I was buying an entry-level property. Uh, it was going to be in a suburb that I didn't necessarily want to live in long term. Um, ultimately, I would get a tenant in the property and I would rent where I wanted to live. Uh, so for the first 12 months, I knew that I would have to live in it um, to get some home home first home buyer benefits. Mm -hmm. So that's like a reduction in stamp duty and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, First home buyers now are in an even better position in Victoria because there is no stamp duty um, under a certain threshold. Um, but the ultimate aim for me was to uh, rent that property out. So the advantage of that, um, well, there's a few advantages really. Um, the first is that you get to set up the lifestyle that, that you would prefer um, by getting someone in your property and, and renting where you want to live. Um, so I now live in Richmond, um, much closer to the city than where my investment property is. Um, my property is also negatively geared. So there are tax benefits that come with um, paying for things like uh, the gap in the mortgage. So say, for mm -hmm. example, um, off the top of my head, say, for example, your mortgage is $2,000 a month, but your rent only brings in $1,500. Um, there are tax breaks on that gap. Um, even the cost of the water bill, which I pay, um, and the council rates, all of those sorts of things add up as a tax deduction at tax, tax time. Um, and ultimately, I now have someone in my property. I really don't think about it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I am allowing it to sit there and, and hopefully build in value. Um, so that I can eventually use the equity in that property to take my next step. Had I waited to buy something that I wanted to live in, it would have been far harder to enter the market and it would have taken me longer. Mm. So that's kind of like a you could buy maybe, say if you're a younger person, you might buy a house in a suburb, but if you wanted to rent in the city or you want to be closer to work or activities, whatever it is, uh, you would maybe rent an apartment or something like that, something that probably doesn't make a lot of sense to buy financially. But it's the lifestyle you're after, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So when I'm when I moved out of my property, um, I managed to get hold of a two bedroom house in Richmond, um, which I would never be able to afford to mm. buy um, as an owner. Um, but because it had two bedrooms, I, I went back into a housemate scenario. Mm. Um, and so I was splitting the cost of that with someone else. Um, and it meant that my rent on that property where I wanted to live was actually less than my mortgage. So there were a lot of advantages there. Mm, for sure. Now, uh, one other thing that you pointed out in your book is about that property is not a get rich quick skip, which we do talk about a lot when it comes to any investments that you should be looking for a longer time frame. 
Now, something I see going around quite a bit is all those property spruikers and different property development seminars and things like that. So how can young people avoid these traps? I think doing an extensive amount of research is key. Um, I know that in my case I was lucky to have my dad, who's obviously a, a trusted person to, to mm. get financial advice from. If you don't have um, those kind of key financial people in your life, I encourage you to talk broadly to people in your network, people who've already entered the property market, um, getting advice um, from someone who's already been recommended by someone else is a really good start. Um, in terms of property developers, the, the off the plan thing um, is really tempting often um, and uh, not all developers are the same. They're not all shoddy. Mm -hmm. um, but what you essentially want to be doing is making sure you're buying in an area that makes financial sense for you and is also a good investment. It's harder to know how that's going to play out when, you, mm -hmm. when you're buying off the plan. Um, I, I don't want to say don't do it, um, but I do say uh, to everyone who asks, you really need to do your research. Talk to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, when I was looking, I talked to all sorts of people, people who'd bought off the plan, people who'd bought, bought existing properties, people who'd bought regionally. Those conversations were really valuable in helping me work out what my decision should be. Mm. Um, mortgage brokers, um, buyers, agents, uh, any a lot of these people will give you a, a one-off consultation. Um, the more conversations you have and, and the broader your knowledge base, the better you are. Mm. And I think that was the overall theme from your book is do your research because that's what you did. You spent a lot of time thoroughly researching why you were saving the deposits. So mm. it's a good thing to keep you occupied while you're trying to cut down on the social That's exactly activities. it. I mean, I never intended to buy in Mordialic. And when I was starting to look, Mordialic wasn't even on my radar. Mm. I wanted to buy in Richmond. Um, and that just wasn't feasible for me um, from a growth perspective uh, and from a cost perspective. Mm. So then I had to cast my net a little bit wider. And that was a result of, of talking to people in the industry, finding out which suburbs are on the up. Um, and where was a wise place to invest and take the emotion out of it and, and work out what was the best for me long-term. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, it sounds like you've got a combination of two different types of people. You've got people that are professionals and are incentivized to help you, but then perhaps trusted friends, family or colleagues who aren't necessarily incentivized for their own reasons. They're just willing to offer that free information to you. Absolutely. I think don't underestimate um, your network of family and friends who have bought property because they have lived experience and they'll tell you things that, you, that may not even have occurred to you um, purely as a result of the experience that they've had. Mm. And I think reading through the book, it was quite interesting to learn about the different fees involved because I, I haven't gone through this process and I had no idea all the different um, I'd heard about stamp duty, but there was all these other taxes and lawyer fees. And so that was really good to learn about by just simply reading this book. Mm. I certainly hadn't prepared for all of those mm. those extra expenses. Um, I mean, I had broadly, but the reality of paying those some of those sums at the time of settlement um, and all of those sorts of things. And lender's mortgage insurance, which I used because I didn't have a 20% deposit, um, which has its pros and cons, but that was sort of built into the cost of my loan. Mm. Um, and for me, I chose to, to, to have that expense uh, because had I waited another 12 months to enter the market, uh, it, it would have made less financial sense to do that. So it was smarter for me at that time. You've really got to be reading the market and understanding whether that's a smart decision or not. Mm -hmm. One thing, because I, I kind of have a gripe against lenders mortgage insurance because I don't think it's a cost that people have to pay, but I did appreciate your comments that you've made before, which are to the effect that you were able to almost haggle on the price of the property and therefore you were willing to stomach that other cost because you got it down to a more reasonable level for you. Mm. I think that's a good way to look at it. So I did a couple of things. I, I actually bargained the price of the house down by the exact amount that the lender's mortgage insurance was. So in my mind, I'd cancelled out my, my lender's mortgage insurance. Um, but also if you if you buy, and again, I'm just going to use some, some random numbers here, if you want to buy a house that's priced at $450,000 and your lender's, lender's mortgage insurance is going to be $10,000, but you, if you wait a year and that property is then worth five hundred thousand dollars, then you've you're actually ahead by forty thousand. So even though you've had to to put up that ten thousand, if the value of the property is going up 
at a reasonable pace, in my mind, it it, it, it makes good sense to use it if if that's right for your circumstances. Mm-hmm. Sure. Now, uh, and one of the other topics that you talked about in your book was side hustles, and that's probably something I'm quite interested in. And in terms of people that maybe you can't get enough put aside in your day job, but starting something on the side to add a bit of extra money to your deposit. Did you start a side hustle when you were saving? I had several side hustles. I had a side hustle while I was saving. I had a side hustle in my first year. Um, I'm really lucky uh, as a writer. My um, my skill set lends itself to doing side work. Um, mm-hmm. So I'd ha- have a full-time job and, and write freelance features on the side. The, the biggest challenge in terms of doing that power save period is, is you either have to drop back your cost of living, so reduce mm-hmm. your cost of rent and all of those sorts of things, or increase your income. Um, so I would encourage people to to think about a side hustle. Um, my disclaimer on that is it is really time consuming and also stressful if you don't enjoy that work. Mm-hmm. And I know it's a luxury to enjoy a side hustle, but uh, if you are working outside of office hours, um, you can very quickly burn out. And I, I did down the track burn out mm-hmm. from from working myself yeah. into the ground. Um, so so what I would say is by all means take on a side hustle. It helps to love it. Um, it also helps to know whether you've got an end point or not because if it's if it's ongoing uh, for the foreseeable future, um, it, it can be really challenging in terms of maintaining your relationships and having enough time for yourself. You still want to enjoy your life. Mm. That's really important too. Yeah. <laughs> did, you sure. meet, and did you meet any young people that were taking on second jobs? Uh not second major jobs. One of the girls that I did speak to who was extraordinary was uh, working in administration uh, in the mental health industry. And on top of that, she was doing um, shifts for um, disabled people uh it, in the evenings and on weekends so she was going over to their home and making sure they had everything they needed and and feeding them and um, often doing that shift overnight um so she Mm. also said that she needed to to make sure that that had an end point Mm. because the uh, emotional drain of of the day itself followed by um the evening work and she had a partner um it was not sustainable long long Mm. term so a lot of people that i talk to maximize their income uh for for a finite period of time uh knowing that that they would eventually get past that Mm. Mm. that's great and we've got one question here which is now as you look back as a homeowner what are some of the biggest lessons learned if you could summarize it like in a very short i maybe okay another way to frame it would be what would you do differently what would i do differently Oh, that's such a difficult question. Um, so th- there are a couple of things that I, I probably would have done differently. In hindsight, I probably could have waited another six or 12 months and saved more and made sure I had more in the bank for that first year. Um, I really got down to the wire on that. I mean, mortgage stress is um, where you're paying any more than sort of 30% of, of, of your income on, on, your, on your mortgage. Um, for me, I'd really underestimated um, body corporate fees, um, council rates, all of those things really do add up. Uh, so I probably would have had a little bit more in the bank at settlement. Um, I also really do love the idea of one day having a freestanding property. Um, There are a lot of challenges for me that came with buying an apartment in terms of um, the body corporate Mm -hmm. and understanding how all of that worked uh, and all of the costs that come with that. Um, Having said that, my property was what I could afford at the time and being in the market for me in the the past almost seven years now, um, six years now, uh, is, is well worth it. Um, but I do think this idea that property prices are climbing so fast that you've got to get in right now um, can be a, a dangerous mentality, and that was my mentality. Um, I think there are lots of things that you can look at, save a little bit longer, maybe buy regionally. Um, really think about what your lifestyle values are because you really don't want to lose yourself in that, and for a while mm. I, de- I definitely did. I think that's a really good point to make, right? It's The way I frame it is kind of like the biggest – financial decision you make in your life to let FOMO or the fear of missing out you know rule that decision it's okay to take your time you know as you said there are strategies you can put in place with LMI to perhaps get in sooner but there's no need to rush 
Absolutely. You, you really you really don't want to regret that decision um, because the thing with LMI is, again, that is the sort of thing that relies on you holding that property for 5, 10, 15 years potentially um, and making sure you get that capital growth. If you rush into something that you regret and then want to sell, um, the cost of buying and selling is extraordinary. Mm-hmm. So you really need to make sure that that is something that you are going to be happy to hold for a while. Mm. Great advice. Yeah, it's very, very high entry and exit fees. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. You, if you, if you want to sell in two years' time, um, the chances are you're not going to have potentially seen the, the growth mm. that you would have hoped for. Mm. So it's, it's realistically, it's a, the best benefit you will get will be from having it as a long hold. Yeah, absolutely. And as a young person, maybe looking to learn a bit more about property and getting started with that, what resources? did you use or would you recommend for people to use? Um, I used a lot of resources. The reason I wrote the book was because there wasn't a lot out there that was Mm. speaking to me at that time. Um, But I was frequently on realestate.com.au, the the property websites, looking at the, looking at the, um, what was happening in the market, what the prices were going to auctions. There's a big difference between what the property is, is listed for and what it actually sells for. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the people that I interviewed said, you know, you can learn a lot by how many people are bidding. Did it get passed in? The best research you can do is going out, pounding the pavement, walking into those properties, seeing how much bang you get for your buck. Um, I think that's far more beneficial than trying to reach property books and, and work out what mm. a good decision is it's really knowing the market inside out and what you should be paying at the time that you make that purchase and it costs nothing to go to the auction it costs nothing to go to the auction it costs nothing to go to open for inspections this is what i realized when i wasn't going out with my friends <laughs> <laughs> new activity <laughs> spend my saturdays going to open for inspections um and and seeing seeing what my options are and, and making sure that when it does come time to make that purchase i, I know exactly how much i should be paying mm. Okay, Nicole, so thank you for joining us on the show. Sincerely, you've got your book out now. Where is the best place for people to grab a copy of this? Uh, You can purchase the book in all good bookstores. Uh, You can also purchase it online through sites like uh, Booktopia. Uh, And it's also available on my publisher website, Mm blackink.com.au. And if people want to find out more about you and the book and your journey, they can head to your website, which is smashedavocado.net, I believe. Yes, I have a blog, smashedavocado.net. And um, your so own website? I'm there. I have my own website, which I haven't done much with lately, nicolehaddo.com. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and you can find me on Instagram, Nicole Haddo. Great. We'll provide sh- um, links in the show notes to all of these. But there is one thing that's on your blog, which I thought was really cool. Kate and I were talking about it off air before you came in, which is the five for under 500,000. Uh, yes, this is my favourite thing to do. <laughs> yes, yeah, so can you explain? I'll let you explain it. So when I was writing um, executive property for the Financial Review, I was writing five or ten top end listings, sort of you know twenty six mm. million ridiculous, <laughs> yeah, right. ridiculous palatial properties, um, and I thought how fun it would be to have five under five. And this is this is part of my obsession with scrolling uh, property websites and and seeing what's out there. And there are some amazing mm. finds under five hundred thousand dollars. So if it you know if it fits with your lifestyle if it fits with your long-term vision for, for what you want your property portfolio to, to look like. Look at properties that are under 500000 and 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 see what kind of opportunities are out there. I, I, I saw that there was some regional towns, there was all over the country, there were some metro areas. There's lots to look at. Some of the photos are incredible. Incredible. It actually takes me a long time because I like to find ones that have you know, amazing pictures. Um, sure. Some of them are obviously run down, but they've still got some sort of charm. I mean... Regional cities are amazing. You can still get um, a, a beautiful heritage home for less than 500000 and I don't know how long that's going to last. So I know we talked about not rushing, but I'm pretty keen to, <laughs> I'm pretty keen to get hold of, of, uh, of something regionally maybe. Yeah, nice. Well, that's a great way to end the show. Nicole, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Thanks, Nicole.